All right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, the name is Volga, and together with my colleague, Dean Biller, we'll be talking about advances in the Oculus Rift SDK. Uh, before we do that, however, I wanted to do a quick dive into the history, sort of the evolution and philosophy behind the PC SDK, because I feel it's important to understand where we're coming from to see the kind of features and uh, our, our focus on one, uh, what we've been looking at as we've been developing the Rift SDK through the years. So the Rift SDK, as some of you might remember, I imagine, uh, back in the day when we shipped the DK1, uh, we shipped our first point one release. And roughly about um, uh, two and a half years ago or so, we ended up shipping uh, the CV1 headset, which is when we finally transitioned to a full proper release, and that's when we also shipped the 1.0 uh, version. And currently, we are uh, shipping the 1.30 version, and we are actually in the process of uh, shipping the 1.31. And if you do a quick back of the envelope calculation, you'll find out that that equates to about a point release every month or so. And one of the reasons why we keep updating the SDK as well as the runtime quite rapidly is because we are looking at striving to have a healthy VR ecosystem. To have a healthy VR ecosystem, we need also healthy and productive app developers that are creating the high quality content that are also doing them in shorter amounts of dev time. To achieve that, we need the developers, you guys, to be able to focus on that thing that makes your application unique, fun, and engaging. And to be able to do that, that's where we come into play. We're taking on the role of creating those things so that you don't have to, where if every developer needs it, we will end up creating that technology so that you don't have to rehash technology. And to that end, over the last four years or so, we've shipped uh, quite a number of features that we've been talking about, uh, things like from the very early days of doing chromatic aberration correction, uh, to more recently starting to use adaptive GPU performance, real-time latency and prediction, all the way to some of the most recent things like async space warp, and even uh, adding the DX12 and Vulkan support. And maybe also, just as important, uh, we've been every step of the way shipping all of these features right out of the box with our Unreal and Unity engines. And actually, speaking of that, I was curious to see a show of hands of how many people here directly code towards the uh, UE4 and Unity engines as opposed to using the native uh, SDK. Could I see a show of hands? Cool. And who here is directly coding to the native SDK API? Nice. That's a, that's a nice spread we have in the room. And I wanted to st uh, stress that those that are using, of course, we as the PC SDK team, we're the ones creating the native API, but all the things we're going to be sharing today are actually important for those that are using our native engine integrations as well. So just uh, keep your ears open and eyes peeled so that you can get all the information that we'll be sharing today. And to that end, uh, our agenda is fairly packed. And without uh, further ado, I want to dig in with a quick recap of our facing technology, which is going to be important to understand the first item we'll be talking about. So consider a regular VR app timeline. And in particular, in the Oculus case, you have the Oculus Compositor running every frame, trying to start a little bit before VSync and trying to complete its work just before VSync ends up happening. And the, the time the compositor starts is kind of a special event in the timeline, which is something we call composite. The compositor, because it resamples the HMD pose, effectively the rotational latency you see in your VR application is going to be dominated by when the compositor can start its work, because that's the point it will start to do the time warp calculation. And it's trying to eventually show that image to show up uh, on the screen, which is what we call the photon time, or when the display starts to eliminate those photons so your eyes see it. So effectively, this time gap is the rotational latency gap. And then you also, of course, have your VR 
uh, application running on the GPU. Again, it's doing a certain amount of work, trying to complete all of its work just before the composite time happens. And of course, the GPU work done by the application is being done, generated by the CPU workload, which is generating all the draw calls. So the flow diagram can look something like the arrows you see here. The positional latency in this case is mostly going to be dominated by when the application CPU workload starts, because in pretty much uh, most of the applications, the app will first sample, again, the HMD pose along with the controller poses before it starts generating the draw calls. And again, um, the face sync time that, it, that is being monitored every frame is this little section called the buffer gap, which is from the point when the application completes its GPU work to the time when the composition is about to start. And facing is constantly monitoring this little gap and trying to adjust that time by using the uh, delay that we purposefully put in when the application calls OVR submit frame. Or in, uh, also, we recently announced that we now have an OVR end frame call as well. So face sync ends up changing the amount of time the app CPU ends up sleeping so that when the app CPU wakes up, it will have just the right amount of time to complete the work before composite happens. Since applications from this diagram, you realize, don't, should not really actually care about vSync time, we can drop that away along with the compositor and solely focus on what the app CPU and the app GPU are doing. So again, focus on the positional latency up above. And in this case, if we were to compare the workload uh, in this particular sample with an app that is doing a lot less work than usual, when we schedule for something like that, the positional latency will effectively go down because now the app CPU and the app GPU can both start later in time and closer to composite time. Similarly, if an application needs a lot of uh, resources to complete its work and it's, uh, it needs to take a huge amount of time, FaceSync will make sure that it is going to take all the time it needs by sleeping a lot less in the OVR submit frame call and giving it all the time it needs. But of course, if you look at the positional latency again up top, that's much larger than usual. So getting all the time you need isn't always the most beneficial thing to do. So a quick, quick re recap of FaceSync is that it minimizes the positional latency by making sure that the app gets all the time it needs, but it pushes it all the way close to the end. And it works in complement with ATW and ASW, which are async time warp and async space warp. So while phase sync is lowering the positional latency, async time warp is lowering for rotational latency. And when async space warp kicks in, the application is go, gonna go down for the Rift CV1 for instead of 90 hertz, it's going to go down to 45 hertz, and face sync becomes aware of this, so it doesn't try to schedule the application as if it wants to start up every, uh, every refresh rate of the panel. And one of the cooler features of face sync is, of course, the fact that it's always active. It's transparent to the developers as well as the users. The instant you, the application starts, it actively is there trying to adjust for the start time of the application. So knowing all of this, now we can start looking at adaptive compositor kickoff. You can think of uh, it's adaptive compositor kickoff as the feature that is focusing solely on the compositor timing. And in this case, again, we had pointed out that the rotational latency was strictly bound by when the compositor starts off. The primary goal of adaptive compositor kickoff is to prevent the compositor from dropping frames, which effectively is going to cause jitter. And the secondary goal is to make sure that we can decrease our rotational latency as much as possible. The way we achieve this is by pushing the compositor to start as close to vSync, whereas the primary goal is to pull the compositor as far away from vSync as possible. But when you consider the fact that if the compositor were to go over, finish over the vSync point, and that would cause dropped frames and uh, consequently jutter, our primary goal is always trumping our secondary goal. But when you start implementing a feature like this, there's a lot of considerations to take into account. For example, the um, preemption quality can differ between different operating systems or the kind of CPU and the GPU you might be using. For example, it's no secret that uh, Windows 10 
has better preemption than Windows 8 and 7, and yet another reason to step away from those, um, uh, the, the older OSs. Also, your application might be doing, or rather, the PC itself, given that it's a multi-tasking uh, environment, uh, might be doing something else on the side other than just running the application, the VR application you're trying to run. And you end up running into potential CPU and GPU contention. And again, Adaptive Composer Kickoff is aware of this. And also, the application, the VR application specifically, might be submitting a lot of variable amounts of workload to the compositor, maybe uh, a huge number of layers. It might be also simultaneously trying to composite Oculus Dash, which is running at the same time. And each of those layers could have different qualities, causing a variable amount of uh, GPU hit. So these are all the considerations that Adaptive Compositor Kickoff needs to look into. And you can think of this feature as quote unquote face sync for the Oculus Rift compositor. Effectively, Adaptive Composer Kickoff is looking at that feedback gap, which is the time difference from when the compositor completed its work to when vSync is about to happen. And it constantly is adjusting the start time of the compositor so that it can, the compositor gets all the time it needs without going overboard. And the cool part, again, is that it works in conjunction with facing. So while facing is adjusting for the application start time, it's trying to hit this composite time, which is also actively being modified by the adaptive compositor kickoff. Effectively, the end result is that it helps mitigate poor performance where you might have a not so stable system or a slow system. But on the flip side, if you have a really good, extremely stable system, then you'll actually get better, lat uh, better latency and better performance out of it. So the cool part is we actually shipped this feature about a year or so ago, and we were able to do that because the feature itself is transparent to both developers and users alike. And the key metrics here are the fact that we saw a huge decrease in the number of dropped compositor frames with this feature, especially with lower spec PCs. And with high spec PCs, we actually saw about a two millisecond drop in rotational latency <clears throat> which uh, compared to our uh, previous method that we were using. And if you're curious about how this thing is working under the hood, you just want to see it in action in real time. As a developer, you can always query for this variable that we expose in our OVR parse stats API. Uh, but if you, as a, even as a consumer, you just want to see this immediately, you can bring up our perf, perf HUD using the Oculus Debug tool and navigate to the composite render timing. And the graph on the bottom right-hand side is going to show you how much this feedback gap is uh, changing and how the compositor, uh, adaptive composite kickoff is trying to minimize that. And you can also go to this link to get more info on all the different things we do actually show in our perf HUD along with this particular feature. Next up, I wanted to talk about a feature that maybe doesn't get a lot of attention from some developers. And there's also some uh, mystery that I wanted to dispeckle. Some of you might have heard of sRGB. It's the pretty much the industry standard color uh, space used for uh, a lot of uh, real-time applications, on specifically on PCs and consoles alike. And it's mainly used for 8 bits per pixel and the cool part of sRGB is the fact that GPUs have native support, both reading from such textures as well as writing right out to them with the raster operators. And while we also would like to make use of sRGB, there are certain issues when you try to use sRGB in VR. sRGB, the way it was originally uh, proposed, the images you see in sRGB color space are meant to be seen with a certain room brightness. And if you think about a, an HMD, where when you put it on, it's pretty much a light-locked uh, environment, and it can even be darker than a movie theater. And you also combine that with the fact that OLED panels that are used in HMDs can show extremely deep, dark blacks. And as the user keeps looking at those deep, dark blacks, their eyes start to adjust for that darkness. The end result can be that you start seeing color banding in some of those dark levels. And we've seen some uh, users complain about these issues. The quick solution is to basically use one of the two high precision formats that we provide in the SDK. 
namely the 16-bit floating point or the 11, 11, 10 floating point format. If your application doesn't need the alpha channel, we'd highly recommend that you go with the 11, 11, 10 format uh, because it has the best quality to performance ratio. If you uh, quickly do the math, you'll realize it fits nicely into the 32-bit bits per pixel size. And the way you would use this is basically after you do your tone mapping, if you happen to have HDR tone mapping in your application, instead of writing that out to an sRGB buffer, you would just write that out to one of these two formats. And then what happens on the other side after you submit those frames? Well, our Oculus Compositor takes those frames. We clamp it from the 0 to 1 range. So you shouldn't expect us to apply any kind of HDR bloom effects, but we do keep using that high precision that is between the 0 to 1 range. So effectively, we take that data and we temporal dither it over the 90 frames per second so the, with the noise, the effect practically becomes invisible. I, wa I wanted to point this out because we've seen some developers who were kind of confused as to whether or not our panels were 8 bits or 10 bits or 12 bits, and we j I just wanted to make sure that folks are aware that this is actually what's going on under the hood. And speaking of temporal dithering, I wanted to go a little bit deeper into that and how not only we do it and how you might be able to do it as well. So for those that might not know dithering, here's a quick, perhaps exaggerated version of it. If you look at the high precision uh, nice gradient on the right hand side, the more you start decreasing the color precision, if you're not doing anything intelligent behind the scenes, you'll effectively get something that looks like uh, the, the image on the left hand side. However, even some of the most naive noise implementations can start to give you something that looks a little bit better like the one you see in the middle. And that if actually has the same color precision as what you see on the left-hand side. And then the temporal aspect is that you start to change that noise pattern every frame, and next thing you know, it starts looking a lot like what you had on the high precision end. So, this works because our HMDs are running at 90 hertz and it's practically invisible. And the way you can do this for your own application is by applying the temporal dither in your own application and then just submitting us the sRGB buffer. This is effectively going to help you save bandwidth and performance uh, down the line compared to, say, the 16 bits per channel. Uh, implementation. And the way you would go about doing this is, again, after you do your HDR tone map, you first do the sRGB gamma conversion and then go through the temporal dithering algorithm that I'll be uh, quickly showing in a bit. And then you, after that, you write them into the sRGB buffers instead of an HDR buffer, and that's what you submit to our uh, compositor. Here's a quick look at the kind of noise that we would recommend. It's called a triangle noise, and uh, instead of applying your noise between the classic 0 to 1 level, we'd recommend that you go from the minus 0.5 to plus 1.5, and I'll share a bit how you can achieve that. But the, the nicety here is that if you think about how the noise profiles change from one step to the next, when you let them overlap by half a step, when one step's noise level starts to decrease, the other one starts creeping up, that allows you to get a constant noise profile so you don't get uh, um, anything that looks different based on the step level. And I wanted to also briefly share and show how simple this can be if you wanted to implement it in your own application. Um, so a quick look at some shader code. This would be the entry function into the temporal dithering logic where you inject a tone mapped sRGB color into uh, this function. And as the triangle noise happens to be a simple uh, double call to a 0 to 1 range, you just add them together, you bias it by half a step, and then you get the new minus, uh, five, minus 0.5 to plus 1.5. And the randomization or the noise function itself is something that you guys might have come across if you've done some uh, noise uh, patterns in GPUs where you needed some kind of random number generator and it looks something like this. We'll be sharing these slides later as well, so no need to take notes right now. I wanted to also uh, do uh, 
reference a few other um, tech talks uh, or um, references that you can look at later on your own spare time, uh, namely the Limbo and Inside Graphics talks where they do a deep dive. And the plated folks at GDC do a really nice in-depth uh, review of all the different, not just the visuals, but also the reasons and the math behind doing these kinds of things. Also, uh, the image I had just shown you from the noise pattern is from a shader toy example, and you can go to that on this link and start messing around with it yourself right there in your web browser. And if you happen to have the code uh, license to Unreal 4, you can also look at their own sample implementation, which does this. And the cool part is they also apply this to the 11, 11, 10 floating point format. And also, about a year or so ago, when we saw that Elite Dangerous folks had a lot of this banning artifacts, we actually reached out to them specifically to see if they might be able to inject some form of temporal dithering into their scenes because their deep dark space scenes showed a lot of banning as the luminance levels were gradually rising. And once they applied that, they were kind enough to do it and eventually shipped it not too long after that and the results were quite astounding actually. And last but not least, I wanted to also plug our own uh, Martin Mitring, who wrote an extensive blog post about this, where he goes into a lot of different methods of doing dithering and the reasons why you might want to pick one versus the other with performance analysis behind every single thing. All right. Next up, I'll be talking about FOV stenciling. And as some of you might have used it, it perhaps in uh, other APIs as well, FOV stencil or field of view stencil is effectively a coverage map that we as the SDK provide to the application, which allows the application to clip out those pixels that would either be really hard to see or completely invisible when you view it from behind the lens. The idea here is that you would use them in your IFOV layers or IFOV depth layers or as well as I matrix layers where you, the expectation is that this particular layer is going to fill the whole screen. And the way it's set up right now for CV1, it will save about 8% of the pixels that the application would have rendered. That is in the rectilinear space, meaning it's the pre-distortion savings. I'm not going to straight up say that it makes your application 8% faster because that is highly dependent on how your application actually deals with pixel shading, but it will save you from shading all those pixels. And the cool part, if you want to actually see this already in action, is it's currently in use in our Oculus Home application. And if you just run, uh, if you put on the headset and you happen to run the Oculus Mirror app, from your desktop, you'll be able to see what the uh, culling profile looks like. But I'll just also briefly share it with you guys here. So we have this feature again implemented in our, in our beloved Oculus World demo. And if you bring up the render target FOV stencil option, you'll see the different methods we have. This particular image is rendered without um, any clipping, of course, but we are looking at the pre-distortion image because that's where the clipping is going to work. So the, this is kind of what the clipped version would end up looking like. And in this particular case, you can actually query different modes for the clipping uh, mesh that we provide. It will effectively be a triangle mesh, though. So for example, you can query the invisible region, which will give you the outer region. Or you can query for the visible region, giving you the uh, area inside. And you can also query for a border region, which is giving you that uh, the, the outline right between the two. And this ends up being a, a line list. And last but not least, you can query for a visible rectangle. And this is particularly useful if, say, your application is trying to render a mirror on the desktop and you don't want to see that clipping FOV stencil. This quad is going to give you that area you can use as the maximum size before you end up bleeding into the clipping region. The API is fairly simple. Um, it's the get FOV stencil function. The first time you call it, it will tell you how much memory you need to allocate. And the second time you call it, it will actually give you back your index and vertex buffers. And one cool aspect of the API is that it will actually customize the mesh based on the different properties you provided. So if your application happens to run to a different FOV port, you can provide that and the mesh will be customized to work with that particular FOV port. 
So a few usage tips to make sure you get the most bang out uh, for this uh, feature is to make sure that you render it either into a stencil or a depth buffer. That is going to help you uh, rely on the fast and early rejection of the pixels before they even make it to the pixel shader. You might have heard of features such as hierarchical Z, hierarchical stencil, Z call. These are effectively hardware acceleration features that different vendors have built that are there to help you avoid even running the pixel shader. And the way you make sure you're, you're actively using these features is to make sure you're clearing your depth or stencil buffer every frame. And you're not trying to use perhaps a depth or a stencil buffer that was prepared in a previous frame, trying to blit it from one previous frame to, to the new one. And you want to also make sure that you avoid uh, modifying your depth and stencil in a pixel shader as much as possible because that is effectively the, one of the ways you can accidentally uh, disable this. Here's a quick sample use case. For example, if you have your mesh queried as an invisible area and you're trying to render it into a depth, the way you would approach this is by first clearing your depth buffer to the far clip value, and then you would render the stencil mesh to the near clip value. And any 3D object you render in between the near and the far clip will get properly clipped out by this invisible mesh. The trick here is also that you want to make sure that you're using this clipping uh, stenciling mesh for your full screen passes. Things like if you happen to have a deferred rendering engine, you definitely want to use this in the G buffer combining pass. Or if you have to happen to have any kind of depth of field or bloom pass, you want to make sure you're using it there as well. And if you happen to be submitting this depth buffer that you just generated to our SDK in an IFOV depth layer, you want to make sure that that area that was rendered to near clip gets reset back to the far clip, which is going to be um, something uh, you'll realize why we're uh, asking that for that. Next up, uh, another use case could be that you're querying for the visible area region and you want to use it on a stencil buffer, perhaps. It's fairly similar to uh, the previous method. It's just that you now this time clear the stencil buffer and you render this mesh into your stencil with a particular value and then you adjust your stencil pass value to be all the pixels that this mesh rendered. And the next time you start, and the, the next pass when you start rendering your actual 3D objects, those 3D, ob 3D objects will only pass where that stencil was rendered. And of course, the, uh, the, the rest of the post effects and everything need to be handled similarly as well. So next up, we'll dig a little bit into the evolution of time warp because it's going to be important in the next thing we're, we're going to be sharing. One of the very first methods of time warp we implemented was uh, sometimes what we sometimes uh, refer to as classic time warp. Effectively, it's the three degrees of freedom time warp where we're only correcting for the rotational difference of the head-mounted display. And this was introduced back in the 0.4 uh, version. And then not, not too long after that, back in the 0.6 version, when we introduced our quad layers, we also, in a sense, introduced analytical positional time warp because the quad layers would translate as well as rotate depending on your headset motion. And then later, closer to the 0.9 uh, version, we ended up shipping the full asynchronous time warp version. This is effectively, as a lot of you might already know, a feature where we make sure the compositor is always using the last available frames provided by the application. So if the application were to drop frames, the compositor ends up smoothing out the motion by taking the last available and properly time warping it to create that smooth sense of motion. And depending on the kind of layer that's being used, the three versus six degrees of freedom ends up being interchangeable. And then back in the day, around the May 2015 uh, time, with 0 0.6, we actually shipped a depth-based positional time warp solution. There were some interesting Reddit posts where people were liking the results, and it actually has some really nice benefits, just like analytical uh, positional time warp. Instead of using mathematics to calculate the depth, we just end up using the depth that is provided by the application's depth buffer. The cool part is that this feature was fast, and it was very little GPU hit. The downside, unfortunately, is that we actually did subsequently remove it from the next version. And this was mainly because 
we didn't have asynchronous time warp implemented at the time. And positional time warp comes in really handy, and it really shines when the application is actually dropping frames to see how it can smooth both motion as well as rotation. So the, the, um, once we ended up actually getting asynchronous space warp integrated, we decided that it wasn't actually worth looking at getting positional time warp going because we didn't have the depth buffers and it would have been a little too late to start asking for depth buffers from applications yet again. And async space warp was not only correcting for a lot of the things positional time warp was correcting for, it was also correcting for things other than that. But then about a year or so ago, uh, we finally re-enabled uh, IFOV depth layers where we started asking for the depth buffers from applications again. And this happened because we introduced Oculus Dash, where we're doing depth composition with applications. So we figured, is there now a reason maybe that we should introduce our positional time warp feature again? And to talk more about that and uh, other features, I wanted to bring Dean Biller up on stage. Thank you. Thank you, Volga. Yeah, so I'm really excited to talk about async space warp, ASW 2.0. Um, it, we've made some upgrades using the fact that we now have the depth buffers, and it will improve the quality of the ASW and lay the groundwork for even more awesome, cool future, future enhancements. Again, so async space warp is a technique that allows the game to run at half rate. That's really important because you know the GPU, the CPU, these are all uh, scarce resources on the system, and so if we can kind of cut in half what the system is using, you know, all the better. Um, it's not a perfect technique. Obviously, people talk about AS, ASW artifacts. I see them on Reddit. I track them down. And ult ultimately, ASW does correct for everything that async time warp can't. Um, but that means right now we're looking at the positional and the animation in the scene. So if you're talking about the, I'm going to actually start dancing the, on, the, on the stage if you don't mind. But every, in, with ASW, it accommodates for everything as far as moving, you know, actually the head in space, people in the audience. Um, if the game itself moves the camera, ASW uh, covers for all these things. Now, positional time warp only accommodates strictly for head movement, not even for this head movement, just, you know, just lateral or, or within the world movement that the, as a user walks around. But PDW, positional time warp, cannot accommodate for the actual animation. That will still judder with positional time warp, which is one of its downsides. But it's possible to combine them, which leads us to ASW 2.0. This, when an application provides depth to us, we will leave the actual prediction of the head movement to positional time warp. This corrects for all head movement and places the world right exactly where they'd expect. Then ASW is only accommodating for the animation and the, and the in-camera movement, in-world movement camera animation. When depth is also, a uh, good point too, is transparency with the case of positional time warp. You know, how you render and write to your depth buffers will be, will be somewhat varied. And depending on what your level of transparency, that will leave something for ASW to take care of as well. Um, in the case of depth being submitted by your app, if you actually provide, uh, provide depth, PTW will always be on. So now the apps will have these lowest latency perceptually that they possibly can. Everything will be locked exact where it belongs in the world. And then, as we switch over to ASW, that hitch can be very natural and very automatic, and ASW will start picking up for at the half rate all the, all the animation and in-world movement. Here's a dr very dramatic demonstration of ASW. Now, I, this has been slowed down quite a bit, and I did actually want to collect a video that would be visible from all the way in the back of the audience. Um, <laughs> so in this, in this, I actually recorded this myself, and in, in order to get this, this artifact, you'll see in ASW 1.0, if you look at the ridges on the, on the window blinds, you'll see that they're kind of blending together. And that's the, the motion estimator getting confused as I move my head up and down in the case I was making this animation. The, the, the motion estimator is seeing the same color values for those blinds, and so it doesn't see any actual motion. And in the case of, of uh, ASW 1.0, you get this sort of artifacting, and this is, this is pretty common. ASW 2.0, I recorded this exactly the same way, just bobbed my head up and down. But because we had the depth as ASW uh, was, was monitoring the scene, it didn't see any motion. And that's right, because it was only my head that was, was producing the motion. The end result is, if you give us depth and we run ASW, you should see a pretty dramatic improvement in the quality in the, in the animation and far fewer artifacts.
on that point of depth, since we're now wanting depth, depth, using depth from the applications, we're going to have to take into account several considerations as to how we composite particular pieces of the scene. There's actually a whole bunch of rules. I'll try to make these as, as brief and as to the point as possible. But if you think about it, we have, you know, we have quad layers, we have cylinder layers, we have, we have uh, IFOB layers, and we have headlocked versions of each one of these. So you can headlock a quad that's used for a HUD as you're looking around the scene. You can headlock an uh, IFOV layer if you you know, want to bl blank out the, if you want to do a fade or something like that to a solid color, you could use a headlock layer there. So the rules here are headlock layers are technically and in depth composited on top of everything. That's as though that they're stuck to the, mirror, the, the near plane of the user. So if you think of the depth of any, of any headlock layer, boom, it's right there. And this is regardless of the, of the layer type, quad, uh, cylinder, IFOV, it's going to always be sucked onto the neural plane. This is even true if you provide a headlock layer with depth and Oculus Dash is visible. It will stick it right on top of Dash as well. In the case of you have multiple headlock layers, they'll be blended in the traditional pre-multiplied alpha that we do. So it's painters if you have a whole set of these that are, that are being submitted. Basically, the, the recommendation here is, yes, you can, you can submit them. Of course, don't, don't change what you're doing. Just remember that when Oculus, uh, Oculus Dash is reporting being visible, it's probably a good idea to hide them because you will be uh, rendering over top of Dash. The next set, the non-headlock layers, have, a, have an interesting set of rules all their own. In this case, quad and cylinder layers are composited at their own depth. And what we mean by that is, they're actually computed via ray tracer. Effectively, we know we can compute mathematically where the Z values are for each of these quads and cylinders, and they're computed inside the, compo uh, the compositor. The IFOV depth, we basically sample that depth buffer that you provide to us, and we'll, we'll place it, we'll do our best to place it in the world. This is really important because since the quad and cylinder layers have their distance computed, and you're submitting a, a, a layer that has depth that has, that's independent of these quads, it's very likely that you can run into the problem of Z-fighting. Uh, this is actually a fairly common thing that I've seen where you, know, you render something and you assume that it's at the, 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 the same depth, but the problem is, is the quad might be just subtly uh, closer to the user. There's also issues around actual repositioning and positional time warp and latency. And this will lead to Z-fighting between the quads or cylinders and whatever is in the real world. Finally, the IFOV and cube map layers behave as though they were set to infinity. So if you think about you know, where you, a 360 video, you'd probably want to play that in an IFOV layer. In that case, uh, it will project you know, at infinity, and orientation time warp will be the only thing that applies there. This is a, what we have here is a video of how d uh, the X-ray effect, or series animation showing the X-ray effect with depth submission and Oculus Dash. Before was just the actual app's rendering. Here is Dash, and here is, shows the X-ray layer on top. If visible, the Oculus Dash is composited separately, so we actually run it in its own pass to compute everything that, uh, that Dash needs, and then we then combine it in a final, final pass with the application itself. What this means is we'll, we'll, this, we'll use this to compute the X-ray effect. And this X-ray effect you can see here in this image where it's, there's just the, the, a light version of what's behind Dash, or sorry, what's in front of Dash, and that way that the user can still use the UI and still, and still interact properly with what, what they're doing in Dash. The actual X-ray itself is per pixel, and it itself is, you know, if it, the logic is, like I was saying, is if the depth is behind, if, it's, if, the, if the application is behind it, we will lock it out completely. If it's in front of it, you get this sort of ghosting effect. Because of this, this X-ray, we do need depth. We are combining these applications. What we do want is, you know, we want a, a fairly uh, meaningful experience for both traditional apps or, or pre-dash applications and, uh, and existing apps or new apps as they enter the store. So you'll get backwards compatibility or effectively be, be sent into the void if it's either shipped before dash was released or it's not f marked as uh, focus aware on initialization. That is to say that if your app doesn't, uh, if you, you can still not submit depth, but mark your, your app as focus aware, and we'll still try to, we'll still composite dash over top of it. We'll just follow the rules as I just previously explained. If you don't have any of these legs or it's an older app and it hasn't been whitelisted, um, 
Oculus Dash, if it's visible, will hide the VR application. You'll get the void. And when Dash is not visible, the apps layers are, are sorted in traditional submission order. Effectively, all those rules that, don't that, that have been explained for depth and for focus of our apps do not apply for, for applications shipped before Oculus Dash. This allows for all the apps that are in the store. They don't need to be updated. They'll simply behave as they did before. But upgrading will, get, will extend the new behavior to them. One more feature I'm really excited to talk about is related to the hybrid applications we announced to, here at Oculus Connect. This is a desktop Windows swap chains. What this allows us, the users to do is very low latency, low, with low latency, capture windows. The current VR applications, if they were to capture a desktop or capture windows, have to do quite a bit of work um, if they want to get the data of the application, of, of the, the non-VR application into the VR world. They have to copy each, copy each window. They have to contact the desktop uh, window manager from Windows set up all, that, all, the, all those sort of swap chains, do all the copies, and then finally submit in a new texture swap chain. There's a whole bunch of, of, of um, unreliability in this, in this path. Um, Windows has a limit on the number of actual desktop um, duplication sessions you can have going. Um, it wastes re resources. It's highly latent. There, you, know, you don't know if you miss a frame, if, you're gonna, if that will be translated into the app. There's, again, timing inconsistencies. So as, as users interacting with that 2D window, there may be some, uh, some inaccuracies as, uh, when, when they're doing. We have CPU and GPU contention. And these are all issues that we knew we were going to run into in, in working with uh, Oculus Desktop in Dash. Ultimately, we were able to ship this, and we did it with very low latency and, and not that much fuss. Here's what we, how we announced it last year. Again, the old way was, was you know, do you have to do all these copies? Now, the, fa the feature we used for capturing windows within Dash is also going to be extended to, to, uh, to regular applications. We actually will provide an HWIND or HMonitor. This is, these are system-wide handles that the Windows is already familiar and already uses. And you'll be able, you able to take these handles, submit it as though it were a regular texture swap chain, or basically, rather than the, the texture data itself, you just say, show me this HWIN, show me this H monitor. And automatically within that layer, could be IFOV, could be, could be a cube map, could be a quad, the actual window contents will be, become available there. This is to note to say that you're not going to get the data of that window in, in, in your application anywhere. It'll be completely transparent to the application, but we'll have it within the compositor, and it'll show up in front, of the, in, in front with low latency for users. So the, what, what we solved this way by just simply having a texture swap chain available for, for users that doesn't require them to do any other window capturing, no contacting windows. We have a very efficient uh, GPU resource. It will also resolve copies between multi-GPU uh, uh, multi systems. So if the, if the user is running on an Intel uh, uh, um, NVIDIA you know, hybrid laptop, if the main desktop is on the Intel, G, Intel GPU, this will, this will take care of all the copies needed, and we'll do it with the lowest latency possible. The timing will be, will be well, and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we use as few GPU and CPU resources as possible. Um, the one big asterisk on all this is it's not supported on Windows 7. Um, Windows 7 just simply didn't have the desktop duplication or the functionality that we need to do this sort of, uh, sort of feature. That's pretty much it for me. Um, here's some developer resources. Of course, online we have the, the PC SDK samples that we still ship, documentation, developer forms, and even Reddit if you're, risk, if you're, a, uh, if you're a little crazy. <laughs>